Thank you. It's our honor. Um, our next uh, two speakers um, we're really happy to have this year. Every year uh, at the Women's Visionary Congress, we get an update from the wonderful people at MAPS, and they um, bring us up to date on all the research projects that they're involved in. And this year, uh, we have two MAPS staff people who will give us an update. And I'm just going to uh, tell you very briefly about them because it's um, uh, an enormous honor to have them here. Um, Amy Emerson is um, a MAP staff person. She earned her BS in genetics and cell biology from Washington State University. And she has worked in clinical development and research for the last 15 years in the fields of immunology, oncology, and most recently in vaccine development. And Amy has worked with MAPS as a volunteer since 2003, facilitating the development of their MDMA clinical program. And she's currently working with the clinical program manager and is involved in creating the structures needed to support the growing needs of clinical operations and the operations group with the MAPS clinical research studies. And she's also here with her husband and young daughter. And we're very grateful to have both of them here. So please welcome them as well. Lene Ponti is also a staff member at MAPS, and um, she earned her BA in Biological Psychology from New College, Florida. And um, she defended her thesis there, which investigated the impact of sleep disturbance in the pathogenesis of depression in a sample of 360 students. She's a scholar in her own right. And during her undergraduate years, she assisted data collection and analysis of various projects at the University of South Florida's Cardiovascular Psychophysiology Laboratory. And um, she's also uh, served as um, New College's Counseling and Wellness Center student representative and plans to return to graduate school to pursue a PhD in clinical or counseling psychology. And please welcome both of them. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, for the nice introductions. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. A little bit loud. A little bit loud. All right. Um, well, as Annie said, I'm Amy, and Lene and I are both really excited to be here today and to tell you about the research updates at MAPS. Um, I know for myself, the very first WVC was my very first opportunity to talk about working in psychedelic research. And that was really exciting, and it's really exciting. The microphone is not on. The microphone, the microphone on. Switch. Sorry. <laughs> Switch? There we go. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Ah, I thought it sounded yes. like it. I was like, actually, I can hear that. <laughs> so, um, anyway, I was just saying that we're really excited to be here to, to give you an update on MAPS research, but um, also that Annie and WBC was um, the first, the very first one was my first opportunity to ever speak about working in psychedelic research, and it was something that was kind of a little bit of a dream of mine, and so I appreciated that opportunity, and I'm really grateful to be back again to talk about MAPS research. Um, Lene and I decided to give our talk just um, a little bit of a different slant today in honor of talking at the Women's Visionary Congress. So in addition to a research update, uh, we want to honor the women that we work with in our research, and um, we also want you to help us uh, look at whether an organization can be viewed as having some masculine and feminine qualities and whether maybe MAPS has a unique balance of these qualities 
and it affects the way that we do our research in compared to the pharma industry, which was what my background is in. So <laughs> to start us off, um, I'm going to read you a little excerpt from something. Um, it's from uh, Masculine and Feminine Qualities in a publication titled A Gendered Perspective on Organizational Creation. So then you can keep these in mind as we give you our talk, and you can let us know what you think at the end. So the first excerpt is from the Jungian view. Masculine is discriminating, goal-oriented, drawn to explaining, improving, and providing. And the feminine is nurturing, holistic, and accepting. Um, well, there, let's see. And then I just want, also wanted to point out that we're just saying that these are masculine and feminine qualities. And of course, we know that they're found in both men and women. <laughs> and then the, fact, the second uh, um, excerpt is, from the feminist deconstruction and political perspective, and it suggests that the male-oriented bureaucratic organizations objectify work through symbols and identity which suppress the feminine voice. An alternative feminine bureaucracy is based on affiliation, self-determination, social good, and equality. I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who are not as familiar with MAPS, MAPS is a 501c3 nonprofit research and education organization that was founded in 1986 by Rick Doblin, who is also here today. MAPS was also founded at New College of Florida, where I graduated in 2010, and Earth and Fire from Irwin also graduated, as well as Rick and numerous other MAPS staff. So we think that the approach that MAPS takes is unique. Um, we work, with a, work in a very heavily regulated and standardized field of clinical research, and we also have to work within a lot of government regulations. And we do this all in hopes of getting an approval for an integrated and maybe not so easily standardized drug plus psychotherapy approach. But we feel that this has a potential for true healing. Um, and so we want to look at this idea from of a, a balanced approach from multiple points. We want to look at it from the MAPS organization, from the people that make up our research teams, our therapeutic model, and then even the participants in our research. In essence, MAPS functions as a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, which is a term that you really don't ever hear. And the goal of MAPS is to develop psychedelics and pres uh, medical marijuana into prescription medicines in order to provide relief for conditions um, for which conventional medicines provide only limited relief. And some of the conditions that we're working with include post-traumatic stress disorder, autism, drug dependence, pain, and end-of-life anxiety. So right away you see that MAPS is different from the traditional drug development company because you don't hear of too many nonprofit pharmaceutical companies out there. In fact, it's quite a tradition of making quite a profit from pharmaceuticals. So, uh, in thinking about um, MAPS, and I would keep thinking of MAPS as being non-traditional um, in reference to the pharmaceutical industry, but then in thinking of the word tradition and then thinking of the values um, of the group as I was preparing this talk, I started to think, well, maybe MAPS is actually incorporating some very traditional ideas that have been part of psychedelic therapy and healing traditions for a very long time, and maybe it's actually the for-profit world of pharmaceuticals that has lost tradition. So, um, see, now that you know a little bit about MAPS, we want to show you our wonderful clinical research team. Uh, back here you have pictures of, of all of the clinical research people that help make all of this work happen. Um, together we develop, manage, monitor, analyze, and write about our clinical studies, and we all bring different aspects of, those, uh, of that work to the, to the group. Um, you see that there's a lot of women in the group, so... There's uh, one way that we're very feminine, but that's really not so unusual in um, the clinical research industry. It's very heavily women-oriented in the groups. But what's different here is the values of our group, and I think that's what makes us special. Um, the values that we have really are reflected across all the work that we do. We have a real respect for each other, for the healing traditions, and for science. Um, I think that some of the qualities of the group are that we are logical, daring, supportive, smart, creative, rule-abiding, and most important, boundary-pushing. 
Here's uh, just some fun pictures of our group at work. Uh, so we enjoy each other not only in the office or when we work from home and from teleconferences, but we also get a chance to work together in some other settings, and I thought it might be nice to see that. Uh, the top picture is of Valerie and I working in Switzerland uh, monitoring the LSD study with Peter Gasser. And then there's another picture here. It's a little bit hard to see, but this picture is special to me. This is the whole company came to my living room for the last off-site meeting because I have a new baby at home and I couldn't go to the meeting. And I don't think you'll find that in very many companies. <laughs> so, and then the last photo is of Vera. She's uh, one of our series and she spoke here last year. She's at home with her new baby right now. But um, this is her and I in Valerie's house preparing for a trip to go to Charleston to initiate our MDMA PTSD study in veterans that the Myth Hopers are doing. Um, and then I also wanted to share a picture of the newest MAPS members. We're very pro-family. We've expanded the MAPS membership by four recently. <laughs> and I know all of us really appreciate working in a group that values both the work life and the home life and offers us the flexibility to still be make big contributions while also being at home and being moms. <laughs> so. We additionally have some members that we don't get to see very often. They are working as our extended MAPS team in the Middle East. We have Camila, um, Dua, and Aviva, and they work in Jordan and Israel, and so they're a very important part of Rick's goal of peace in the Middle East through MDMA studies. <laughs> So that's the team, and now Lene is going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So what is MAPS up to these days? Um, right now, there are current studies um, investigating MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. We're hoping to start a study that investigates MDMA for autism. Additionally, we're looking at LSD for end-of-life anxiety, and Ibogaine for opiate addiction as well as marijuana for post-traumatic stress disorder. All of these studies are in differing stages of development, and uh, today we would like to focus on MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder as the basis of our discussion. So Australia, uh, and that's pending funding. And next, Amy's going to tell us about MAPS's therapeutic approach. <clears throat> so why MDMA for PTSD? First, I want to look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. We look at this as a fear-based disorder. It's triggered by a traumatic event, such as a military combat, sexual assault, or natural disaster, and it's, chronic and it's a chronic debilitating mental condition. Right now, current approved treatments fail to provide relief from, relief from many of the people suffering from PTSD. Um, it's important to note that we have a way of measuring PTSD. We use something called CAPS. It's a standardized questionnaire. So because we have a way to measure PTSD, we also have a way to measure changes that happen in PTSD when a therapy is applied. Um, and we also have a very highly sympathetic patient population that includes veterans, survivors of sexual assault, abuse, accidents, and trauma. These trauma survivors often experience a lot of guilt in their lives, dissociation, alterations in their personality. Um, they have marked impairment and ability for intimacy and attachment. So their whole lives are affected and they really don't have many good treatment options right now. So why MDMA when there are other psychedelics that might also work? Well, we think of MDMA as a treatment for the fear. Um, some people say that MDMA is a very nurturing, heart-opening quality. Uh, these qualities in conjunction with therapy, with psychotherapy, allow, we hope, allow the potential for deep healing. That's just not possible with the approved drugs that are out there right now that only treat symptoms and also have to be taken daily. Um, MDMA has the potential to reduce the fear responses in the participants, increase trust and empathy. The experience can be gentle but really profound and it allows for an integration of the experience. We also think it's important that there's more therapists that have personal experience working with MDMA and maybe more that are willing to have personal experience working with MDMA than some of the other classic psychedelics. And we think this is an important part of them working with these participants. Um, so we're hoping that the benefits of using a combination of drug plus therapy will go way beyond the effect that the anti-anxiety drugs that are approved right now, like benzodiazepines, have. So it's a lot of work to get this approved, um, and we really hope this integrated approach does get approved. Sorry, I 
I've lost my slides here for one second. I just get to get back to it. So I've been saying that MAPS has an integrated approach, and I want to talk a little bit about what I think that integration is. We're working to create this MDMA-assisted therapy, and in doing this, we have to do a lot of clinical studies that have to be approved by the FDA, or any in any country, we're working with different regulatory bodies. So in order to, to work on these clinical studies, we have to pull from the traditional clinical research side of things, and we also are pulling from the psychedelic therapy side of things. So uh, we have some aspects of our work that come from clinical research, and let's see, I want to look at slides here. So we use a lot of standard procedures and by using a lot of standard procedures and standard protocols and standard data collection forms, this helps us to move through the different regulatory bodies and, and, and review boards that we need to work with in order to do our clinical studies. Um, we have standard ways of capturing the data. We administer a drug which is also a very standard approach in clinical research. We, um, after we administer the drug, we collect accepted outcome measures and then we monitor all of the data, we collect it, we put it in a database at MAPS, we analyze it, and we feel all of our data is auditable, which is also very important when you're working with regulatory agencies. So these are things that we're pulling from the traditional side of clinical research. But we're also pulling um, into our protocols some approaches that are more from the psychedelic therapy, such as having a male-female co-therapist team. This comes from Stan's work um, on LSD on LSD therapies and um, we also really value a nurturing environment for these to take place in and it's a requirement for all of our clinical sites to have an environment that is appropriate for doing the experimental sessions in. We're using MDMA, uh, we're choosing it because it's heart opening, it allows people to experience and express fear, anger or grief and not be overwhelmed by these emotions. It's not just um, dampening the symptoms that people experience. We really value the um, integration that is needed to happen for people to have healing. We include some measures in our clinical studies that are not so traditional, like measuring states of consciousness, <coughs> looking at spiritual experience. And we, as I said before, we, we value that our therapists maybe have had some personal experience with MDMA so that they can better help the, the participants in these studies. So our premise really is that, um, is that the medicine, the MDMA, is not in itself a therapy, but that it's a powerful tool for the clinicians and the participants. And so one of our challenges in um, integrating these, these different ideas is that we have to measure not only the effect of the drug, but we have to measure the effect of these non-drug elements that I've talked about that we think are important. So to do this, we've been working on developing a treatment manual, a therapist training program, and adherence criteria ratings so that we can standardize and measure these additional factors in our clinical studies. Um, this is a picture of the front of our treatment manual. The goal of our treatment manual is to document the core elements of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy in the treatment of PTSD and to educate therapists about the phases and steps involved in conducting the therapy. It's the basis for our clinical trials, and it's really an important part of us validating this treatment. Um, and while we recognize that it's important to have a standard approach and to validate this treatment, we also know that there has to be flexibility for these therapists to work. So this provides a structure for the therapy, but also allows the individual therapists to include interventions that are based on their own training and experience and clinical judgment and their intuition as they're working with the patient's unfolding experience. This is also, I would say, quite unique to MAPS because most of the time there's not a lot of intuition and flexibility allowed in a protocol. So we're really trying to combine a lot of different ideas and I think, we're, I think our protocols are really doing a good job of that. Some of the techniques that you'll find um, in the treatment manual, and I brought two copies, they're on the back table if you'd like to take a look, and um, all of this literature is also available online. And um, some of the techniques that you'll find, well, all of them closely align with those that you hear about with psychedelic harm reduction, um, setting uh, a safe place, uh, sitting not guiding, talking through not talking down, and difficult is not the same as bad. And so some of the techniques that you will find include create and communicate a setting of safety and support, nurture an attitude of trust in the healing properties of the therapeutic process, 
introduced the concept of the participant's inner healing intelligence. And this one really gets me, because I can't help but think what the pharmaceutical industries would say about our own inner healing intelligence. <laughs> um, utilizing a largely non-directive approach, encouraging participants to set aside their expectations and have um, what we call a beginner's mind and remain open to whatever comes up and also encourage periods, periods of inner focus, balance with periods of communication. Um, participants are given eye shades, and if they want to just you know, close their eyes and go inside for a period of time during therapy, they're very much encouraged to do so. Lastly, validate the value and importance of positive affirming experiences as part of the process of healing and growth. And as you can imagine, these techniques are not easy to standardize. So this is, you know, one of the greatest challenges, but greatest rewards. I chose to include this slide to uh, show you the difference between the setting of a traditional drug study and that um, which some may call the psychedelic bed and breakfast, which is Michael and Annie's treatment room in Charleston, South Carolina. And subjects are able to stay the night after their therapy sessions, and this is so important because they stay in this place and they begin the integration process, which is so important, rather than mm -hmm. going out to the real world and starting to do their laundry right afterwards. Um, so Ooh. the participants, <laughs> um, they are able to choose music if they want to have it there, and this, this treatment room is really a serene and, and welcoming, comfortable setting. This slide represents the treatment process for subjects enrolled in MDMA PTSD therapy, and after they finish these screening and baseline measures, they have three 90-minute non-drug introductory therapy sessions with the therapists, and the purpose of these um, non-drug intro sessions is to get the subject comfortable with the therapists and begin to build the therapeutic alliance, which is so important. And after that, the participants undergo three experimental sessions, um, placebo or not, and these last about eight hours each, and the experimental sessions take place about three to five weeks apart. And the morning after an experimental session, um, a non-drug integrative session takes place. And then two more non-drug integrative sessions take place between all experimental sessions. And um, I just want to make a note that one thing that makes uh, MAPS's approach very unique is that the therapists are very accessible to the subjects throughout the entire enrollment. And every day after an experimental session for the following week, Michael or Annie or the therapist will call the, the participant on the phone and have a five to ten minute conversation with them just to check in and see how they're doing. And uh, after outcome measures are collected, after two months, um, we collect follow-up information one year later and all of these trials um, are randomized in that the participants are randomly selected for either the placebo or the experimental dosage and they're placebo controlled and double blind meaning that the therapist and the uh, subject as well as the independent rater are all naive as to what the dosage was. And you could con contrast this uh, treatment process to maybe another drug trial that would be take this pill for the next 30 days, fill out this questionnaire, and then come see me and tell me how you're feeling. There's not a lot of contact, you know, and not a lot of integration in most trials. So this is a, this is a lot of work for the therapist, but it really makes a big impact. Some of the inclusion criteria for participants include they must meet dsm 4 criteria for current post-traumatic stress disorder and they must have had at least one unsuccessful drug therapy treatment a uh, minimum three months, or have had at least one unsuccessful evidence-based psychotherapy for a minimum of six months, and they must be willing to taper off any psychiatric medications and refrain from taking them for the duration of the study period. And now I would like to introduce you to some of our therapists in our studies. Meet Michael and Annie Offer. Many of you may already know them. Annie spoke at the very first Women's Visionary Congress five years ago, and they reside in Charleston, and that's a photo of their treatment room. They are pioneers of the manual, manualized therapy, and they lead the therapist training program. They traveled to Israel and Jordan a few months back to uh, train the therapists there in the new upcoming studies. They are practitioner, practitioners of holotropic breathwork, 
and they receive assistance from their study coordinators, Sarah, and independent readers, Mark and Joy. Uh, meet Barbara Speak and Peter Gasser, the therapists of the Swiss LSD End of Life Anxiety Study. Uh, I haven't met them before, but Barra had the opportunity to meet them when she was in Switzerland last year. And Peter told her that at the beginning of every therapy session, he opens it up by playing the drums. And I dare any of you to find something like that in a traditional drug study. Uh, uh, to the right is a picture of their treatment room, which is also warm, welcoming. And they receive assistance from their study coordinator, Christina, and their independent raider, Marcella. Meet Peter Owen and Verena Winmere. They are the Swiss therapists in the MDMA PTSD study. And on the right is a photo of their treatment room. And they, like Michael and Annie, are also a married couple, and they're just lovely. I had the opportunity to meet them when I was in England a few months ago. And meet Ingrid and Andrew, the upcoming therapists for the Canadian MDMA, MDMA PTSD study. They, uh, Ingrid is a psychiatrist and a practitioner of holotropic breathwork and has written papers and uh, leads workshops for holotropic breathwork. And Andrew has been a psychotherapist for 40 years, and they're so eager to start, and we're so eager to begin working with them, and they've been wonderfully patient as we're waiting on an import permit from Health Canada. And we have three teams in Israel, Karen and Ido, Marina and Daniel, Tali and Naftali. <coughs> and in Jordan, we have two co-therapist teams, Mona and Nasser, and Taisir and Melik, and we're really looking forward to begin, beginning to work with them. <coughs> So how do we train the therapists? Well, Michael and Annie and all the time that they have, they lead a five-day training program. During the training program, uh, participants, or the new therapists, review videos and they go through the treatment manual together and verbally discuss, discuss the adherence criteria. And later, the therapists are given the opportunity to legally take MDMA by enrolling in an MDMA study for healthy volunteers. And the way that um, it's planned to ensure adherence criteria in future studies is that new studies have uh, open label lead, lead in participants that um, are not blinded and they receive the full dose of MDMA and these sessions are recorded and Michael and Annie watch these video recordings afterwards and they actually give the therapist feedback on their therapeutic approach, um, and then they're given the green light to go ahead and continue with the study. What is the full dose? The full dose is 125 milligrams. Plus a supplemental dose of half. 75? Yeah. And next, Amy is going to share some information about the participants. So before we talk about the women in our clinical studies, I want to actually take a quick historical look at how women have been included in studies. And uh, in 1970, you can see that only 18% of participants in studies were women. And by 2006, it had increased to 34%. But as you can see, the inclusion of women, um, it, though it's increased, it's still low compared to the percent of women that um, are experiencing the diseases that are being studied. So they're still not well represented. Part of the change of actually starting to include more women was because of an FDA. Oops, sorry, I need it. Because of an FDA change in policy that happened in 1993, uh, it was two important changes. The FDA finally provided some formal guidance to drug developers uh, to emphasize its expectation that women should be included and represented represented in all clinical trials. And then they also altered a 16-year policy that excluded women with childbearing to potential from early phase clinical studies. So, as you can see, it's, you know, prior to 1993, there was no guidance on this, and women really weren't being represented, and so drugs that were being developed really didn't include the data from women. Um, for, oh, I'm going to let Lene tell you about the women in, in our studies, so. and we'll steal your slide. <laughs> I'm taking it. I'm taking it back. All right, as you can see from this slide, um, women are represented, uh, there are more women participants in all of MAPS' MDMA PTSD studies, and epidemiological studies do show that after trauma, women are more likely to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, and 
it's not because they're more likely to seek help. That's not the reason. And in this way, MAPS uh, is aligned with this demographic, and females actually represent 82% of all participants in our MDMA PTSD studies. And I'm going to talk a little about, bit about reasons for enrolling. Um, these three pie charts represent the trauma types for the U.S. pilot study, the Swiss study, and the U.S. Veterans of War study. In the U.S. pilot study, we enrolled individuals with um, crime victimization and combat-related post-traumatic stress disorder, and 80% of the subjects had sexual or physical abuse or rape that led to post-traumatic stress disorder. In the Swiss study, we enrolled participants with any type of PTSD, and 60% developed PTSD from sexual abuse or rape. In our current study that's looking at um, U.S. veterans of war, it's a war-related post-traumatic stress disorder, and we've enrolled five participants, three women and two men. Two out of these three women have enrolled, um, and their trauma type was being raped while in the military. And um, like any research, there's more questions after you gain more information. And one of the biggest questions that we have now is, should the treatment method you know, be tailored towards the type of trauma? And with more studies, we'll be able to further elucidate this question. So many of these participants have concomitant depression and anxiety, and for this reason, they would probably be excluded for studies like this, but luckily we're able to include them. And they would typically be treated with Zoloft or Paxil, the two FDA-approved SSRIs for PTSD that show very limited relief. So there are differences in enrolling between male and females in the MDMA PTSD studies, but a data analysis showed that there's not a gender difference in the, tr the treatment response. And next, Amy's going to share a little bit of the data. So from our first study that was done in Charleston with Michael and Annie for MDMA PTSD, this is um, a summary of the data. So you can see from the first bar that this is the baseline CAPS. And if you remember, I said CAPS was one of the standardized measures that we have for measuring PTSD. To the study, and to get the participants had to at least have a score of 50. So the average score was 80 at baseline. Now, after the experimental sessions were completed, we again looked at the CAP scores, and we found a big reduction. Um, people had a score just a little above 20 on average, so they even they were no longer considered as having PTSD after the after the therapy. And then, really important, as we looked um, at the follow up, a long term follow up time point, and these were anywhere from a year to uh, three years later. And you can see that, that that treatment effect was enduring, that the average score was still 20. It's really impressive data. I wanted to share some other benefits that people said that they had besides just not scoring as having PTSD anymore. They also had some, some a real effect on other qualities in their life, such as their 90% of the people said their general well-being was better, that they had an increased self-awareness and understanding. 80% experienced less excessive vigilance. 75% had less avoidance of people and places. 65% had fewer nightmares, flashbacks, intrusive memories, and an increased ability to feel emotions. They had reduced anxiety. 60% of people experienced improved sleep and improved relationships in general. 55% had improved relationships with their spouse or partner or other family members, and they had an enhanced spiritual life. And then another 50% said they became more involved in the community and the world around them and had an improved mood. So you can see that these are really big changes to the quality of people's lives. Um, some, some people wrote us little specific notes about additional benefits they had, and I thought I would share some of those. One person said they had an increased ability to stay with and handle getting through emotions. They had a better connection to their body's needs and physical <coughs> sensations. Um, another person began to draw again after stopping at age 12, so their creativity is enhanced. Another woman said that she wanted more for her life and wanted a real life. And I think this was after a long period of feeling very detached from life. Um, another person said they don't let people take advantage of them now, and they have a better relationship with their children. They play more, and they're less serious. These are really some wonderful benefits. It's also important to show that uh, there was no negative effect on the cognition of the people in the study. So as you can see, there's this is the bar show, the placebo in purple and the MDMA group in blue at baseline, very similar results and for the measure of cognition. And again, two-month follow-up, really no difference. So 
as you are, as I'm sure you get concern for uh, regulatory agencies is that we're showing safety. This is a graph showing our, the results of our CAPS in the Swiss study. It's not quite as dramatic as uh, the US study, but still impressive. Again, at baseline, you see that people were, sk were scoring uh, well over 60 for having the baseline CAPS. And again, they had to score at least 50. And then after drug, uh, the average was below 50, um, a little around 40. And then in the follow-up in this study, the, actually their CAPS went down a little bit more. So um, we're still looking at to see the differences between our studies to see why it was a little more dramatic in the U.S. study, and we're exploring that more in our future studies and more with these uh, measures that Lene talked about, about looking at adherence criteria and looking at videotapes and providing a lot of training. So this little brief summary of our results. So the MDMA is more effective than placebo, and this is according to the accepted test of PTSD symptoms. Again, this is the CAPS that I talked about. Um, there's a sustained benefit, uh, that, that there's also an important part, that, which is the non-drug therapy that allows integration between the experimental sessions. There was no drug-related serious adverse events in 51 MDMA sessions, again, very important to all the regulatory agencies that we work with, and there was no evidence of impaired cognitive function. Some of the women in these trials have been so moved by their healing that they have been vocal with media representatives, and I chose to include this article. It was published in 2007, the Washington Post, and it features a woman named Donna who was a subject in the you can imagine this is a U.S. pilot study, and Donna suffered from PTSD uh, due to sexual childhood sexual abuse, and she stated that before. I knew the path was through a battlefield, but I could not get through it. And this speaks to you know some of the emotional numbing that survivors of PTSD have. During MDMA therapy, I knew I could walk through it, and I wasn't afraid. MDMA gave me the ability not to fear. And I wanted to include these other quotes. Being able to feel again is indescribable, like a blind person being able to see again. I used to have a barrier between me and everyone else. Secondly, I got a glimpse of what I'm capable of growing into. I'm motivated to keep practicing openness until it gets more developed. And I like this latter quote because it really speaks to the fact that MDMA is not a magic pill. It's not, it's not, it's not a magic bullet, rather. But that um, these participants, they work really, really hard to get the healing. And, and March, March's edition, Oprah Magazine, published a story that was called Can a Single Pill Heal Your Past? A New Kind of Therapy. And the Oprah team created this image. Oh. And, uh, it's an energetic depiction. We don't actually give our subjects glowing isotopes. <laughs> it's a great image that I like to use. Uh, some of the new measures that we hope to include or are already including in our upcoming studies include heart rate variability, which has been shown to be irregular in individuals with PTSD, and it's thought that this is because they're in a constant state of hypervigilance. Um, functional fMRI, um, facial EMG, which is a psychophysical test that measures emotional reactivity, and it's really cool. They actually measure the, um, the muscles that uh, allow you to smile and to frown. Um, also, serum oxytocin, which has been shown to increase with MDMA, and uh, cortisol, which is the main stress effector neurohormone of the body, and would give us a biological correlate to show healing. And some new self-report measures include the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, which is the measure that I used for my undergraduate thesis, and it'll allow us to show that uh, sleep quality is improving, um, and that this goes hand in hand, hand with the healing. Uh, lastly, the States of Consciousness questionnaire to look at the mystical type experiences that subjects experience and how this may have to do with the healing. Just a quick update on our current PTSD studies. Uh, like I said before, we have enrolled the first five out of 16 total in the U.S. Veterans of War study in Charleston, South Carolina. In Jordan, the protocol has been reviewed by their FDA and the study initiation is planned to take place in August. In Israel, this study was just initiated on uh, Monday, and we should be enrolling participants any time now. In Canada, we're still waiting for that safe inspection and an import permit, but we are optimistic and think it's going to happen any day now. 
Uh, the marijuana PTSD protocol was approved by the FDA, and we are now waiting to hear back from NIDA PHS. So it's estimated it'll cost approximately 10 million and take eight to 10 years to develop MDMA into a prescription medicine. Also, it will take about two years and $1.7 million to finish the current phase two studies. And on behalf of all of those who have received healing through these studies and all of um, the MAP staff, thank you so much for the past 25 years of all of the support. And we hope that you are able to continue to help supporting the mission and so that we can all see it come to fruition. And lastly, I wanted to let you know that MAPS will be celebrating its 25th anniversary this December 8th to the 11th. This event will take place in the San Francisco Bay Area and will feature pre and po post conference workshops, a Sunday brunch, a tribute dinner for Stan and Christina Groff. And I really hope that you can join us. Thank you very much. I was wondering if I could mention the auction. Um, would that be okay with you? Um, yeah, so I'm volunteering for MAPS to, because um, uh, they're going to be having an auction at, um, at this conference that's coming up, and we're trying to uh, tap into, creatively tap into the resources in our community. And so if there's anyone who makes crafts or owns a restaurant that they'd be willing to donate a free dinner or has a vacation home that they're willing to um, give to MAPS for a weekend, we're going to um, auction these things off and help to raise money for these projects. So if you have any ideas, um, please talk to the MAPS people. Thank you. Can you explain the difference between phase one, two, and three trials? Sure. So uh, phase one is usually just a safety study, and they're very small pilot studies. And then in phase two, you start to, you, you've shown um, some safety so that the FDA or whatever regulatory agency you're working with feels more comfortable with you moving on. You start to enroll more people, and you include, uh, you start to look at efficacy, and you start to, um, include people with uh, maybe a broader range, like they're not just healthy individuals. So usually phase one is only healthy individuals, and in phase two you start to treat people that are actually affected with the disorder. And then in uh, phase three, you've already looked at and shown that you have a lot of safety data and efficacy data, but now you have to prove it in a bigger population, and you have to prove it across, um, like usually multiple sites doing the same protocol so they can see your results are reproducible. So they're much bigger studies when you get to phase three. Now phase four would be a post-marketing study, which we hope to get to because it means that we would have an approval. <laughs> Why does it seem that more women develop PTSD from, as a result of trauma? Is there any data? I'm not sure. It was just, it's part of the epidemiological data that we've looked at, but I don't think there's an answer for it. Um, I was wondering what kind of um, care or attention are given to the placebo patients. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that MAPS does really well is that we have people that enroll in these studies and they might get placebo. And it's a big chunk out of time, out of their life that they spend to come and because they really want some help. And everybody that's enrolled that gets placebo gets the chance to repeat the study with the full dose MDMA. So it's, it's really a really nice model. What exactly is happening during the eight hour session? Uh, read our treatment manual. <laughs> okay. yeah, no. so, um, so some of the things that Lene, I think, read off one of the slides that uh, were some of the, some of the, the, the processes that are used or some of the, the, the um, therapies that are used. Mostly the people come in, they're given the, they're given the MDMA and then they're, they sit and they can have eye shades on, they can start to listen to some music and then after about an hour if they haven't started, started to talk the therapist will prompt them to start talking and then if they start talking and they don't bring up the event previously they will have agreed with the therapist that the therapists can then bring up the event. Right, and so then they would start to talk about it. There's actually, during the eight hour period, there's probably a lot more quiet 
than um, there is during an integrative session because we, they're allowing the person to go inside and experiencing you know this this inner process that we feel is important. Um, so th there might be a little bit of body work that might go on if it's needed. Um, and does that answer your question yeah. enough? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> There's one in the back. Not right now, we haven't. And uh, right now we're just working with adults <laughs> that have PTSD. Two more questions? Okay. So I think there's two hands right here that I've been seeing uh, in the black. Hi. Uh, what are the prospects for getting NIDA approval for the marijuana school? Rick. <laughs> <laughs> What's the update? Uh, well, I, used, I started out by thinking that we had zero chance. And that was the Is there, for our last question, is there somebody that's had their hand up for a long time that I haven't noticed? Could you jump up and down if, the, if you're one of those people? No. Okay, so there was somebody here in the blue. <laughs> um, I had a question about who has the patent or the rights to the MDA and they want to sit. It's off patent, which is also oh. another unique thing about MAPS, is most companies wouldn't try to touch working with something off patent because you can't make any money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you all.